When I say polka, I feel like the first thing that pops into people's mind would likely be polka dots or maybe the polka dance. But very rarely, I would assume, people would think of the polka cardigan. But that is exactly what this particular book is referring to. Published in 1847 by Jane Gagan, this book is the ladies' knitting, netting, and crochet book. And Jane wrote and published this book here in 1847 at 63 George Street in Edinburgh. It's really neat to be here where she probably spent a lot of time together with her husband and the printer that she used to print the book is also just down the street in the other direction. It was wonderful and super immersive to be able to visit the home that Jane likely wrote that book in when we were in Edinburgh and just seeing the whole neighborhood as well. But anyway, moving on to what we are going to be working on today, there is a particular pattern in this book called the polka. The polka dance was sweeping Europe in the 1840s and many things were then named after the polka dance, including a sort of jacket. I have also seen it referred to as a Polish police, but Jane in her book specifically calls it a polka and there's a few other books around this time that also mention a knit polka. Many of them are for children's garments and what makes me really excited about Jane's version specifically is it's meant for ladies. There's a few fun things about the construction of this piece, which I'm excited to go into a little bit more detail about. But in general, I find that this is one of the earliest references of a ladies knit garment, outer garment that is meant to be worn and seen. And that makes me really excited. <laughs> if you're new here, welcome to Engineering Knits. I love doing historical fiber crafts. Knitting has a special place in my heart, which is why this particular project was so much fun for me. We have brioche knitting, we have intarsia, we have making false ermine fur. There's plenty of interesting things about the construction of this polka jacket, and I can't wait to share more of that with you. So let's go ahead and get started working on it. I'm so excited for this project. I'm going to be using swish yarn from Knit Picks, and I needed two different colors, one for the main color of the body, and then white for that kind of ermine, I think is what it's called, that we're trying to imitate along the border. So the first step I think in this, because the pattern is a little vaguely written, is I have to see what my gauge is. Let's gauge swatch first. Okay, I am back with our swatches. So I started with a plain swatch. I just wanted to see what it looked like in stockinette. I chose this yarn based on the required needle size in the pattern. The pattern does not have any gauges but it does, or like real thickness, it just said four ply fleecy, which I know to be quite thick for the Victorian era, but they did say number eight needles, which is four millimeter needles. So that's how I chose my yarn, is one that were often knit with four millimeter needles. And in stockinette, just in case you're curious, I got a gauge knitting flat of three or five stitches an inch, a little under, maybe like four and a half to five stitches an inch. I worked the second swatch in the pattern given Going by the pattern, this is going to be a fully brioche knit sweater, which I'm... I love how squishy brioche is. I just did eight rows. The pattern doesn't say knit for four inches. It says knit for this many rows. And I just want to make sure it's going to fit me depending on my row gauge. So first of all, the row gauge, one, two, three, so I'd say four to an inch. Four brioche, which is eight rows to an inch. Brioche stretches quite a bit. So I'm just going to kind of pat at it and kind of have it lay flat and then squish it down and we'll see what that gauge is from ridge to ridge. Five ridges over two inches, eight rows over one inch. Let's sit down and do some calcs. <laughs> I did a lot of really rough sketching and calculating. I think I've got it figured out now. So let me show you, hold on. Let me bring you in a little closer maybe. According to the pattern, when on the bottom here, we cast on 190 stitches, uh, these 190 stitches are going to be 38 inches wide. The length from the absolute bottom, including the border, to the underarm, as the pattern's written, is 18 inches long. Towards the bust, uh, where we get to the decreases, we're going to be at 33.2 inches. Generally, like I know that this isn't supposed to close, but it should meet at the front. <sighs> I'm back and forth on how stretchy this might be. What I might do is cast on like half the number of stitches and knit a few inches and just kind of feel how stretchy that might be and how that might look. 
so that I can determine if I think that this is going to be a large enough size for me. I have a feeling like it could be okay with brioche. Brioche is so poofy and so stretchy like that might be all right. I just want to test it and before I knit this entire sweater and then ha have it like barely stretching to close. Let me cast on 80 stitches and knit in brioche for a while and then we will come back to this and see how we feel about that. Before I dive too much into the technical details of how I'm going to knit this polka, I wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit about the sponsor for today's video who help make these videos even possible in the first place, and that is June's Journey. June's Journey is a historically inspired mobile game where you have to do some sleuthing to find clues and hidden objects in scenes that are colorfully crafted and wonderfully 1920s inspired. I always like to keep my mind and hands occupied with my knitting, but it's not always possible to have it on me, which is why I like to play June's Journey as a free to download mobile game in those moments where I don't have my knitting with me. I find the detective story woven through the game to be very compelling, and I like to figure out what is going to happen next. And I like the aspect where I get to decorate my little home base or estate. I wish I could decorate my own historical estate, but for now, I'll just do it through June's Journey. If this game sounds interesting to you, then you can download it by clicking the link below in my description. It is available again for free on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on your PC through Facebook games. Thank you again to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Okay, so I have sat down. I knew I said that I was gonna do half of the sweater stitches, but that was just kind of a lot, so I did a quarter. So this is a quarter panel, but I did hold it up to myself. So hold on, let me stand up and show you. So it's gonna be down at my hips and I'm gonna be wearing a lot of skirts. So I think that that is actually gonna be perfect. And from the amount of ridges and the fact, I, I think the border along the bottom and the sides is both supposed to be four inches. And I think I got to four inches exactly with the four ridges. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. I'm starting to understand the pattern a little bit better and I got a little antsy last night, so I actually cast on to start the sweater. I have 190 stitches to start, and then the pattern goes up from 190 to that plus half more, if that makes sense, to count the yarn overs. It's a little bit of a confu confusing counting system, but I think I figured it out, so I'm just gonna keep on knitting. I'm going to check back in once we finish with a bottom white border, and we're switching to the uh, green. Well, I have finished knitting. This should be four inches. Let's see. Yep, look at that. Exactly four inches of the bottom border. And now we are going to tie on the main body color. So this sweater is worked from the bottom up. And so right now we've finished the bottom border. And now I'm going to take this and work the rest. Keeping in mind that we still want to continue a border up the right and left side of this. So the first eight ridges and the last eight ridges will still be in white wool and it'd be kind of worked like intarsia where we'll have two different balls of white yarn at each end to knit that portion. So let's get going. <laughs> morning our power is back on which is really nice here's how far we've gotten on the polka it is oh brioche knitting is just so soft and squishy and i love that some of the earliest knitting patterns for cardigan like things are brioche it's 
wonderful. Can you see right there? So that's the first decrease right in the middle here. And then I did the second decrease right up here. There's gonna be five decreases in total before you split for the front um, and the back underneath the armhole. The pattern's pretty clear. The only thing that was a little confusing to me at first, I, I typically before I knit something, I try to read through the pattern and picture what I'm doing and picture what shaping it's asking me to do. And I was a little confused by the stitch counts for a few times until I realized I don't know if it's because I, like, I have to actually pull out a modern brioche pattern um, to compare. For me, like maybe that's because that's the way I learned it or the way that I do it in my head or the way that modern brioche patterns do it, but I count that as two stitches. So that you have the slip stitch with the yarn over and then the knit two together stitches right here and that counts as two because that makes a ridge and a valley on one side. And in the knitting pattern that I'm looking at, the Victorian one, it this is three stitches. So for the decreases, like this, oh, no, this side? No, this side. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Here's one decrease right there. And I would consider that, and I'm pretty sure that modern patterns would consider that, uh, knit three brioche stitches together because you're knitting together a ridge, a valley, and a ridge. Whereas in the antique pattern, it was knit five stitches together. So when I was first figuring it out, I was kind of doing things incorrectly and my stitch counts weren't matching up and I was like going through and thinking through it and calculating things. But once I realized that that was the difference, it became so much more clear. And I'm also using uh, stitch markers to mark where we're doing the decreases underneath the armholes. All I have left to do is knit exactly the same way, but do three more decrease sections and then we'll be under the armholes. <laughs> this is, I wouldn't call this necessarily a quick knit, but it's much thicker yarn than you would maybe expect for an antique pattern. If you have followed me since like the very beginning of this channel, I knit a full combinations uh, Victorian undergarment in lace weight yarn, and that was, oh my gosh, that took forever. So this is nothing like that, it's much quicker. I wanted to share a little bit more of the progress I've made. So we are now directly to the part where we get to the underarms. So these are now five full decreases that I've done. It was supposed to be that on the fourth decrease you do two next to each other. I forgot. So I did it on the fifth decrease instead. I did two decreases, but I'm at the right stitch count. I just wish I did it a little earlier because I think then it would have taken in like just under the bust versus a little bit tighter across the bust. But brioche knitting is so stretchy and squishy. There's not really gonna be any problem of fit uh, for me. So the way that the pattern has you knit the rest of this is you split for the armholes. So you knit up until the decreases happens, you take that onto a separate needle, and then you work back and forth between the decreases for the back panels, and then it has you slope the shoulder slightly and cast off the neckline. And then you're gonna do the same thing but for the front panels with a little bit of shoulder shaping, which honestly, I was kind of surprised at the shoulder shaping because even some later patterns do not have any kind of shoulder shaping. And shoulder shaping really makes sweaters fit a lot better if you have, like I have very sloping shoulders personally, but I guess it also makes sense because the style at the time was very rounded shoulders. So you kind of, you didn't want things to go straight out. So you wanted to round off the shoulders and the sweaters too, I guess, to get that fashionable silhouette. I think I, I checked my yarn stash the other day. I think I ordered enough. So I, I do think that I have enough yarn, fingers crossed. I feel like now that I said it, I might just get into ch yarn chicken right at the end, but hopefully not. We discussed previously how they mentioned stitches differently 
then how modern day patterns mention brioche stitches, which she calls three stitches. Modern day patterns would call two brioche stitches. So there was some adjustment that I had to make. And the other bit that was a little bit more different was the fact that she would say, until knit until you have 10 ridges formed. But to form one complete brioche row with the back and a fourth in order to make a complete brioche stitch, if that makes sense. So what she meant by one ridge was a back and a fourth. So it wasn't one row, it was two rows. So if you want 10 ridges, you have to knit 20 rows. And that became more clear. So as I kept on reading the pattern, I understood her style of pattern writing a little bit better. And I always read ahead. So I don't, I usually try to read through a pattern a few times to try to picture what the creator is trying to get me to do, especially with these antique and vintage patterns. I have to say this is one of the best written antique patterns that I found. I feel like Jane was such a pioneer in the way that she laid out and wrote knitting patterns. The fact that she included all the annotations in the beginning, the fact that she had the repeat lines very clearly laid out and a lot of different notes in there, more notes than even later Victorian patterns to make sure that you can better understand what she is asking you to knit. These videos will be coming out kind of in sequence, but I am working on everything all together. So I'm also simultaneously right now working on the ball gown and I just took out the silk to cut and I laid down my polka next to the silk and I am so happy with the color choices. I think that they're gonna work together so, so well. So I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Let's keep working on the back and I will check in with you, I think probably once that's done so you can see how that's worked. So it's been just a little bit since I have updated you on this polka. And by just a little bit, I mean it's been enough time where I have both of the fronts nearly done. So I knit the complete back, as you can see here. This is the entirety of the back of the polka. I knit one of the sides and the shoulders match up very beautifully. That's where the shoulders match. Here is our armhole where we're going to set the sleeves in. Can you see that? Yeah. All that I have left to knit, so can you see, hold on. Oh, it's hard to show. So here we are for the other side that I have to knit. So this is going to be my right front, technically. My right when I'm wearing it. Yeah, at this point you can kind of see where I have split out for the back, and then you knit each front separately. These shoulders are going to get sewn up, and then the collar is a separate piece. But for now, let's knit up the other front and then maybe sew up the shoulder seams and I can show you how this looks <laughs> in general so far. <laughs> So I have sewn up the shoulders of the cardigan and I really like how it looks. Let me put it on. It doesn't help that I'm currently wearing a green sweater to show you another green sweater on top of it, but we can try. So it looks a little loose in the waist right now, but in the final instructions, it does have you draw the sweater or polka together at the waist with a drawstring and at the neck. And you also have to remember that this is meant to be worn with 1840 skirts, which are quite voluminous. And this does go past the hip or past the waist towards the hips. So you do want it to be able to be wide enough to kind of spread out nicely across those skirts. So the next step now is to knit the arms and each arm is knit separately. This is going to be sewn together. So it's not like I'm picking up stitches and knitting from there. I'm gonna be knitting two separate arms, seaming it up at the bottom and then uh, setting it into the arm side. They are knit differently though than I would have expected. Many modern day patterns and many patterns even from the Victorian era, although admittedly later on in the Victorian that I've read, start at the top of the sleeve and work down. Versus this one, you cast on from the wrist to the underarm and then you work that way. <laughs> so like around the arm, not down the arm or up the arm. I have already cast on for that. So the cuff is in one color and the sleeve is in the main green color. And at the end of making the bulk of the length of the sleeves, I will also do some short row shaping, which I think is kind of interesting. Almost finished with the pattern after the sleeves are done. The last bit is just the collar and adding the little tufts to make this look like an ermine fur. 
overall, I'm pretty happy with how, how this looks. I just wish I would have been a little bit more consistent with how I twisted the yarn around because right now this looks, in my eyes at least, this looks a little messy, this transition between the white and the green. Anyhow, I'm gonna keep on working on the sleeves. I'm hoping I have enough yarn. I think I'll have just enough, at least of the green, but we'll see, cross your fingers for me. <laughs> Welcome to Edinburgh. We are just kind of relaxing in the evening after we spent all day outside before we are probably going to go out to a pub a little bit later for some food and a drink. And I've been knitting since the last time I saw you, but I'm also traveling while doing this because I'm, I didn't quite get the sweater done or the polka done for the event before leaving home. <laughs> So I've been just knitting in the free moments that I've had and I've made good progress. So here's the sleeve. And to be honest, because we've done so much traveling and so much has happened, I don't remember exactly what I told you last, but I, I do think I let you know that I was working on the sleeves. So here is how far we've gotten. Um, the sleeve is meant to be worn with the cuff turned over. And I don't know if you can see now, but the sleeve is gonna be worn on the, on the shoulder down to the arm like this. And because it's an 1840s um, sweater, the sleeve cap is like really low. So this is kind of a really good length for me personally. I just got done with the basic straight back and forth rows of brioche. Now we're actually going to do short row shaping. But if you look at sleeve patterns for sewing, uh, the sleeve kind of goes up from the wrist and goes outwards a little bit to fit, you know, your wrist is typically a little bit smaller than what your bicep is. And then in order to fit into your sleeve, you have a bit of a sleeve cap that kind of looks like an S curve at the top. This sleeve doesn't have that. 1840 sleeves are super shallow because of the way that the bodices are typically shaped and the armholes are shaped where they're placed and how low they are. So I'm not actually doing any of that S shaping, which is unusual for me, right? So I'm wearing my 1940s uh, sweater that I also knit the sleeve separately and the decreases in the shaping on the top of this sleeve. Well, first of all, the sleeve was it from the bottom up and not like around. And second of all, when I got to the top of the sleeve, I shaped it like the typical sleeve pattern that you would see in a sewing pattern. But this one is a wedge. The short row shaping is basically going to create a wedge on one side of the sleeve and that'll hopefully give me enough of the circumference around the top in order for it to fit my obviously very strong biceps. <laughs> to be honest, I already knit the other sleeve, so let me show you how the shaping comes out one second. Okay, I'm back. But you can kind of see that you get this slope happening where you, it's, they swear it's not the drape, but it's the actual slope where I did the short shaping, and I'm going to repeat that for my other sleeve. next destination. So we left Edinburgh and now we're in Oban, which is a beautiful coastal town. And between the stops and moving from place to place, it's kind of fun. I feel like I have a bit of the trip baked into the knitting up of my sweater. We're just sitting here watching the sunset and it's time for me to finish the last bit of this sweater before I fully sew it together. And that is the collar. It makes mostly sense to me, but the first time that I read this pattern through, I got to a particular point of the collar and I was like, I don't really understand this, so I'm just gonna knit it. And then I hope that once I knit it, I understand what it's talking about. But now I'm at that point and to be honest, I still don't really understand what it's talking about. The collar is knit as a separate piece and there are some short row shapings in the center back of the collar, but then it has you cast off completely for the collar in white. And then it says with colored wool, so for me, the green wool, you pick up stitches at the neck and you knit two plain rows. Is that the neck of the collar? Is that the neck of the bit that's sewn up together? And plain rows, is that plain brioche or literally plain? 
Is it stockinette? Is it garter? It's not very clear. I'm not 100% sure what it wants me to do, especially my initial inkling is that it wants me to knit on the body piece of it and not the collar piece. But after this part, it says to sew up the sweater. They haven't yet sewn the back piece at the shoulders to the front bit, so there is really no neck portion to talk about to knit on this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm a little confused. Then again, I don't have to do that bit until I'm done with the collar, so maybe I'll just push that issue <laughs> until later, and I'll knit the collar first. It's just white brioche with short row shaping in the middle, and I'll see you again when I actually have to deal with the problem of doing those two plain rows. Plain what? Who knows? Let's do some sunset knitting. Well, hello from Elgin, Scotland. What I turned on the camera for was an update for you on the collar portion of this sweater. I am finished with the short rows of the white. And if you remember the last time we chatted, I was a little bit confused about the directions. What I didn't realize is that I missed a step or a part when I was reading it for the collar. I'm actually now more confused. <laughs> than I was before. So the bit that I missed is that I first knit with short row shaping the collar in white, which makes sense to me because the white is kind of that nice contrast to match the white border around the front of this cardigan or the polka. And then I knit with the white all the way to the end of the row, so beyond my short row shaping, and then we tie on the colored wool. So I tie, I like, without casting anything off, I'm now gonna switch back to my green the next line about the short row shaping with the colored wool, it was a bit confusing, but I, I think I understand it. I'm gonna do five rows of brioche without any short row shaping, and then at the end I'm gonna do short row shaping, and I think that that's gonna be the fold over of my collar. I don't know if you've ever sewn collars, but you have kind of like a collar stand, and then the collar itself. So I think this is creating the collar stand, but then now this makes me more confused, because now with the green, I'm going to cast off after creating the short row shaping. And again, it says to pick up the stitches around the neck, work two plain rows, then one row, leaving three stitches at the end, repeat three more times, always leaving three stitches, then turn around and work to end, cast off. First thought it was going to be on the collar, right? Because I haven't, as according to the directions, I haven't sewn anything up yet, but why would I pick up the stitches. Like why wouldn't, if it were around the collar piece, I feel like then I wouldn't have cast off the green before doing this. Jane or Mrs. Gagen's books were, and instructions were much more clear than instructions were in the past, but there's definitely still a lot open for interpretation. Um, I am going to go ahead and switch now to the green wool of my collar to make the collar stand portion. And I guess <laughs> I'll come back to you once I've decided what exactly um, I'm going to do to interpret her words. I'm gonna go grab some tea because it's it's quite cold as you can probably tell. We're in April right now, but um, a cold front and some storms have moved in. It's really uh, blustery and windy. We're right at the North Sea. Now it's just nice to kind of stay inside for the afternoon, do some knitting, do some reading, and drink some warm tea.
I don't know if you can hear the wind howling, but we are now in Aberdeen and it is actually howling and snowing, surprisingly enough. Great news is on top of the wonderful trip we've been having so far, I think that I have sewn all of the pieces of my polka together. So it's all in one piece and I just have two finishing touches left. The collar is sewn on and it was finished. I'm on the fence about how it looks, to be honest. Um, the shape is nice. I don't love that it had me work with the uh, colored wool rather than the white wool all the way through. I think it leaves an awkward band of color, but I think you'll see it in, uh, like to its full effect when I wear it for the final reveal and you'll let me know. I was on the fence about doing it in the first place when it said it in the instructions. My gut instinct was to just keep it in white, but I did want to at least for this polka, follow the ins original instructions as closely as possible. So I didn't want to go stray too far from that. So, you know, you let me know what you think, but personally, if I were to do it again, and I guess the collar piece is really the smallest bit of the knitting here, so I could just undo it and re-knit that bit in all white. I have two finishing steps left. The first one is to really try to sell the look of the imitation ermine fur on the border of this polka. And that has you take about three inch lengths of black four ply fleecy, fold them in half or double them, and then brush it out to make it really nice and fluffy. Then it has you double them again and sew them on, and then take a little bit of um, gum arabic and kind of twist it to make it pointy, to make it look like the black bits of the ermine fur tails that you see sometimes. I don't have gum arabic, but I do have hair pomade, which I think I'm going to use. I did also remember to bring my black wool, so that's what I will be doing next. And then the last bit will be to create the uh, cords and tassels. But first, let's do the ermine fur. I realize now that I never explained exactly what I did around the collar, but I ended up not knitting the two plain rows at all. I did pick up the stitches and try to knit two plain rows at the neckline where the shoulder seams were and I just ended up with too much fabric there and my shoulders were far too low. So I didn't end up adding those just because I personally didn't need it for the jacket to fit. But now the entire polka was done. <laughs> Not only was this polka super practical because it was still quite chilly in April, but I think that it turned out super cute, really close to the engraving and what I was hoping it would look like. And there were some really fun elements in the construction. For example, these sleeves, because of the way they're knit, they are super stretchy. So they'll really nearly fit any length of arm, but they do slip down very often, although Nutella really enjoys playing with them. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Feel free to leave a like and a subscribe. And remember that you can download June's Journey from the link in the description below. Thank you again so much, and I will see you next time.